a very warm and joyous welcome to all of you for our online service today, especially for those who may be new or coming to us for the first time. Our Guru Paramahans Yogananda came to the world to bring us the awareness and the understanding and the realization of our divine infinite self to make us aware that we are not these limited mortal beings that are playing various roles on this the stage of this earth drama. And so Yogananda, through all of his teachings, again and again reminds us of the importance of cultivating a deep relationship with God. Because he tells us so succinctly in so many parts of his teachings that God is the nearest of the near, the dearest of the dear. He is right within us, around us. He is everywhere. Our guru once said, God alone is sufficient, for in him lies all love, all life, all happiness, all joy, all peace. Everything that even in your wildest dreams you could not imagine. He said, cultivate a relationship with God. Practice the presence of God every day and never go to bed at night until you have practiced your Kriya and are filled with joy. Have that eternal peace within and without. So this is the, the message that we, that everything that we have ever desired in this incarnation and all previous incarnations can be found in God, in our efforts to practice deep meditation and to cultivate a, a very intimate and close relationship with the divine in our lives, every moment in our lives. And that is what we'll be discussing in our service today and living in constant remembrance of God, meaning in meditation and in all of our outer activity. Of course, meditation is the foundation of the teachings because it is in meditation that we learn to go within, to still our bodies and minds, and to have that direct, tangible experience of God living within us as peace, as wisdom, as infinite joy. And this is what each one of us is seeking. We can find it within, in meditation. So, Today we'll meditate for a few minutes. We'll proceed our meditation with a chant, I am the bubble, make me the sea. This is a chant of reaffirming that we are like a bubble or a wave in the ocean of God's cosmic consciousness. And we are striving to dissolve ourselves, to be, sink deep into that ocean of peace and joy that lies within us. We should remind ourselves whenever we sit to meditate to sit with a spine erect. Make sure that all the limbs and the muscles of the body are relaxed. To do that, we can breathe deeply and tense the body and then throw the breath out and relax. Let us do that a few times to help us to calm the body and the mind. So inhale deeply and tense the body. And then with a double exhalation, relax. Inhale, intense. Exhale, relax. Inhale, tense. Exhale, relax. From this calm, interiorized state, lift the gaze to the point between the eyebrows. The Christ Consciousness Center, the center of will and concentration. And from this center, we broadcast our prayers, our prayer demands to that indwelling presence of God to help us take the mind and deeper within with devotion. Let us chant that chant, I am the bubble, 
Make me the sea. So do thou, my Lord, so do thou, my Lord, thou and I never apart, thou and I never apart, wave of the sea dissolving the sea, wave of the sea dissolving the sea, I am the Bible, make me the sea. I am the Bible, make me the sea, make me the sea, oh, make me the sea, make me the sea, oh, make me the sea, wave of the sea, dissolving the sea, wave of the sea, dissolving the sea, I am the Bible, make me the sea, I am the Bible, make me the sea. Make me the sea, oh, make me the sea. Make me the sea, oh, make me the sea. Wave of the sea, dissolving the sea. Wave of the sea, dissolving the sea. I am the bubble, make me 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 the sea. Oh, I am the bubble, make me the sea. Let us practice 
this affirmation together, this affirmation of truth with deep feeling. Please affirm after me, Heavenly Father, thy cosmic life and I are one. Thou art the ocean, I am the wave. We are one. Heavenly Father, thy cosmic life and I are one. Thou art the ocean, I am the wave. We are one. Heavenly Father, thy cosmic life and I are one. Thou art the ocean, I am the wave. We are one. Heavenly Father, thy cosmic life and I are one. Thou art the ocean, I am the wave. We are one. Om, peace, amen. If we dwell on those words of truth and more and more make them a part of our being, We'll become aware of that divine presence in our lives in a much more tangible way. Those poetic words, So do thou, my Lord, thou and I, never apart. Thou and I, never apart. Wave of the sea, dissolve in the sea. I am the bubble, make me the sea. That we are all waves in the ocean of God's cosmic consciousness. And the more we stay on the surface, of this material world, and when we forget God, then we are buffeted by the storms of maya and duality. But the more that we can learn to take the mind deeper and deeper within, then we become aware of that being anchored in that which is changeless, which is God alone. That's what we need to do more and more through our meditations and in our efforts every day to cultivate a deeper, intimate, lasting relationship with God. Throughout his teachings, the Master reminds us that God is not just one thing, but God is everything. But it is his, that force of maya, that delusive force that pulls us away from that awareness of God's presence that causes all the pain and suffering that we experience in this world. Our guru said, God is not remote from his creation. He is always with us. You don't see the breeze, but you know it is there. He who made the breeze and us, he is here. Every time I move my hands and feet, I see it is he who is moving them. The whole universe trembles with his presence. And this is what we're seeking to experience in our own lives, to realize underlying everything that we experience in this world, that it is God and God alone. He is coursing through our, our veins and he is thinking through our minds and it is he who is walking through our feet and working through our hands more and more to develop that relationship that he is with us all the time. But that force of maya is very strong. And most people have no concept of God. They don't think of him at all. And if they do, it's a very just shallow thought of him, very brief. But we need to make it deeper and deeper. There was a, a group of physicians who attended a workshop and the presenter was showing different sacred experiences from various times and places down through the centuries. 
And he had slides of various tapestries and paintings and statues, stained glass. And then when he came to one statue, it caught the attention of, of all the physicians there, and it was a statue of the Hindu god Shiva. And it was Shiva in his aspect of the cosmic dancer, Nataraja. And that statue shows Shiva with one foot being supported by a little man who was looking at a leaf. And the other foot is raised off the ground as if he was dancing. And even though physicians are trained to be great observers, when the presenter was asking the physicians what they thought about this statue, all of their attention went to that little man who was setting a leaf. And the presenter just had to laugh and he said, you know, that little man who is studying that leaf represents material creation, so absorbed in material creation. And he doesn't even know that standing on his back is the living God. And that is how we are because that little man actually symbolizes maya or delusion. And it's a matter of where we are taking our attention. Is it outward into the material world? Or more and more are we bringing it within and making that contact with the divine? Then we can fulfill our outer responsibilities and duties in a greater sense of peace and joy. One of the great disciples of Paramahansa Yogananda was Sri Dayamata. She said, actually, if you could but realize it, that divine one whom you seek is within you and all around you. It is not God who is lacking in awareness of us. It is we who must rise above this finite world in an increased awareness of him. She said, the more we become anchored in the real self, our soul, you know, in meditation, she said, the more we become anchored in our real self, the more we immerse ourselves in God's presence within, drunk with one drive, one hunger, one desire, God alone, the more we understand what reality is. The entire being becomes absorbed night and day in one thought, God. But this force of maya is very strong. Its sole purpose is to take us away from that reality, from God's presence. And that is why there is so much suffering and sorrow and pain in the world. Because, to a great degree, mankind has forgotten his creator and the source of all power in this world, the source of all joy and fulfillment. And our guru came at a very critical time in history. The world is changing so fast. And we were getting, getting busier and busier, being absorbed in new technologies and so forth. But that should be no excuse for not living a God-centered life. Guruji said, Ask yourself, why should finding God be my greatest ambition? Guruji says, Because without Him, you cannot fulfill any other ambition. We can fulfill certain things, but not to the degree if we have God in the equation of our lives. Guruji said, To him who says that it is not practical to think of God, I would reply, It is not practical to forget him. If it were, there would not be so much suffering endured in the world by those who have forgotten God. And again, that is why there is so much suffering and pain in the world. We have forgotten the source of our lives, where we have come from, God's presence in our lives. And oftentimes we don't turn to God until there is some tragedy or crisis in our own lives or in the world. Many of you will recall in September 11th, 2001, during those terrorist attacks, caused great, great grief in this country and around the world. And 
For the next week or two, the churches were packed with people. But then gradually, people weren't coming to church again. We have to realize that it's not just in the tragic times of our lives that we need God. We need Him all the time. There was a a story of two men that were shipwrecked out in the middle of the ocean and they were floating on uh, little planks of wood. And uh, one man's name was uh, Mike and the other was Pat. And Mike was thinking about his life and you know he had lived a pretty desultory life. And so he told his companion, he said, you know, I'm going to pray to God. And he said, if he saves us, I'm going to change my life drastically. So he began to pray and then Pat said, wait, wait, I see a ship off in the distance. You can stop your prayer now. And that's how so many people are in the world that we pray only when we need something from God rather than praying and talking to God as a close companion in our lives. There was a physician who was talking to one of his patients and he said, I'm sorry, we've done everything that we can for you. I suggest that you pray. And the man, was just, he, was, he couldn't believe it because it was as though this is the last resort, the final referral to God. But we must reverse that attitude that God should not be the final referral, the last resort. God first, God alone. Diamataji said, in quoting Sri Gyanamata, that one of Guruji's great disciples, Gyanamata used to say, God first, God alone. And then Ma goes on to say, let that ideal be constantly uppermost in your mind no matter what you are doing. Once your mind becomes pinpointed in that consciousness, you will see it is much easier to carry your responsibilities. You are no longer unreasonably troubled by them. To have the mind filled with God when we go into all of our activities and from time to time think of Him. Ma said, no matter what difficulties confront you, remain anchored in God through the practice of deep meditation. Be untouched by outer circumstances. Remember Master's prayer when boisterous storms of trials shriek and worries howl at me. I drown their noises, loudly chanting, God, God, God. I would suggest that you read that poem of the Gurus, God, 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 regularly, because that's the inspiration. That is what his teachings are all about, to bring the mind, to bring the whole being back to that awareness of God's presence. If you just close your eyes, even now, just for a moment, in this present moment, lift the gaze to the Christ center and just inwardly repeat, God, God, God. Try to feel in your heart God's presence. We can do this every day, many times during the day. Guruji said, first and foremost, be successful with the master of the universe. You become so engrossed in material duties, you say you have no time for God. But suppose God says he has no time to beat in your heart, to think in your brain. Where will you be? He is the love behind all loves. He is the reason behind all reason. He is the will behind all will. He is the success behind all success, the power behind all powers, the blood in your veins, the breath behind your words. If he takes his power away, the master said, my voice would be silent and I shall speak no more. If his power doesn't express through our hearts and brains, we will lie dumb forever. So remember, your most important duty in life is your duty to God. To 
bring God into our daily lives. Not to keep him just in some corner of our lives, just on one day a week or... No, bringing him into everything that we do in our daily lives. And now is the time. Don't delay, don't wait. Thinking that, well, maybe later in my life I'll give time to God. Bring him into your life now in a deeper way. Master said, instead of assuming that I have to go on waiting during many lives in order to meet God, I plunged headlong and swam within myself, and lo, I found him hiding within me. I found that forgetfulness and dark indifference were the veils that hid him from me. Forgetfulness and dark indifference. Those are the veils. That's the the satanic veil of Maya making us forget that we are children of God or that we become indifferent, totally absorbed in the outer world. So Master is telling us here that forgetfulness of God and indifference, these are the veils that hide him from us. Guruji goes on to say, I tore asunder those veils and discovered that my memory and my love for him were doors to his presence. So this is the solution. My memory and my love for him were doors to his presence. As often as I thought of him, Guruji said, the door was flung open and I felt his presence. The memory of God is the altar of God's presence. Whenever you think of God, you manifest his omnipresence within you. These are powerful words to reflect upon and to meditate upon of the Guru. That that veil of forgetfulness and indifference is what separates us from God. But then our memory of Him and our love for Him, these are the doors that open to His presence. And our thought. God has given us free will to think whatever thought we want At any moment during the day, we can turn our minds inward and just repeat again, God, 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 or I love you, Lord, I love you, Lord, keeping it very simple, that intimate relationship with the divine. When I was younger and I was starting on my spiritual search, looking to different paths and I was never drawn to those paths that talked about the, that we are sinners. That we are like worms groveling along the ground and to repent and so forth. I didn't even like the word repent but I didn't understand exactly what it meant. But actually repent means to give up their old life and turn within to turn toward the better part of ourselves. I always had a negative connotation, but actually repent is just turning around and going toward reality, toward the goal. Jesus spoke about this. This was an event that was shortly after his 40 days in the desert. The Bible says, from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Guruji gives commentary with these deep truths. Many people look for the vast kingdom of God at a point of space in the clouds, far away from the noxious, sinful vapors of earth. They forget that the vast eternal land of God's omniscience is near at hand. Whenever you close your eyes, you shut out the land of finitude and matter. And before the inner vision of the spiritually developed man, the land of eternity lies tier upon tier in endless vistas. That that God is not somewhere at a distant point. He is right here with us. Just as we can't see the breeze, but we know it's there, we can feel God's presence 
when we take the mind deeper and deeper into the thought of his presence. Master goes on to say, if man repents of his folly of constantly gazing at the finite cosmos and closes his eyes and constantly meditates, he perceives this land of infinity within him. Repentance signifies seeing the folly of life and keeping the attention turned upon matter. The wise man repents because he knows the miseries resulting from the contact of matter. Then he makes up his mind and first believes in the kingdom within. And then by constant meditation he perceives the kingdom of eternity lying close at hand within him. So first we believe. We believe the words of the Master We make the effort to take the mind deeper and deeper within, in meditation. And then we begin to perceive that divine presence. Krishna also reminds us of God's close proximity to us, that he is with us. He is actually seeking us more than we are seeking him. In the Gita, Krishna said, Again, listen to my supreme word, the most secret of all. Because thou art dearly loved by me, I will relate what is beneficial to thee. And Guruji gives this commentary. God's love toward his children is unconditional because he feels responsible for having sent them out from him into the delusion and misery of this world. If they see through false worldly lures and look to him above all, if they love him, the giver, in preference to his material gifts, they return to him by the power of their virtue. Meaning through the power of our own determination and effort to turn away from delusion and maya and turn it toward that inner reality of God's presence. Even in the darkest hours of human decline, Guruji says, when transgressors have become extremely entangled in delusion by repeated performance of wrong actions, God comes through liberated masters or other great incarnations to enlighten and redeem those who repent. And otherwise, otherwise, those who are repenting turning away so much from being absorbed in the outer show and more and more in the inner reality. Master said, after the vicissitudes of many incarnations in the lonesome wilderness of delusive creation, after lifetimes of the romance of hiding and almost meeting, of parting and eagerly being sought, Man cries from the depths of his heart, Enough. Enough. And those of us who have been drawn to a path, like Self Realization Fellowship, have gone through many incarnations of being deluded, being unfulfilled. We've said, Enough. I want you, Lord. I want reality. And then God responds. He sends a true guru and his teachings to awaken us from the dream of mortality and finitude. We talk a lot about meditation, which is the most important thing to do in our sadhana, our spiritual search. And then we take what we gain in meditation and put it into practical application in our daily lives. Bring that presence, that peace, that awareness of God's presence into our lives, to every aspect. This is practicing the presence of God when God becomes the greatest need in our lives. One time a student asked the the master, Sir, what should I do to find God? And he responded, During every little period of leisure, Plunge your mind 
into the infinite thought of Him. Talk to Him intimately. He is the nearest of the near, the dearest of the dear. Love Him as a miser loves money, as an ardent man loves his sweetheart, as a drowning person loves breath. When you yearn for God with intensity, He will come to you. So This is how He's encouraging us to have that intensity, to slake off that forgetfulness and that indifference. When we've gone through so many incarnations of unfulfillment and now we have a teaching that can awaken us to our divine potential, our divine heritage as children of God. And all of us are living in a a very busy world with many distractions and uncertainty and fears and worries. But all of that, all of the outer drama of the show should motivate us even more so to have that intimate relationship with God. A great example of this again is with the Master and Sri Dayamata. He trained her from a very young age in the ashram to take on more and more responsibility. When she came just to love God, to seek God in meditation, but and also to do some other simple work, but he gave her more and more responsibility. So she learned through experience how to bring that presence of God, that awareness of him, into even the most, the busiest outer life. Sri Dhammata said, How sweet it is to recall Master's words to me. Always remember, nothing can touch you if you inwardly love God. This is such a profound statement, a statement that we could strive to incorporate in our lives more and more. He said, Always remember, nothing can touch you if you inwardly love God. She said, I have clung to those words throughout these many years. And I say to all of you, nothing can touch you if you inwardly love God. So love him that you are fully aware of the strength within you, which is of God, the faith within you, which is of God, and that you are fully united with the love within you, which is God. So this is a a key that we can take home with us that nothing can ever truly touch us if we cultivate that awareness that we are inwardly loving God, that he is with us. And Ma goes on to say, this is the secret, and I speak from my own experience. No matter what my duties, the moment my mind stops concentrating upon any particular activity are making decisions about the work. It doesn't turn to useless, distracting things, but rests in the thought of God. He is the center of my life. The mind is with him, nowhere else. So when we finish our duties, you know, rather than letting the mind wander in the maze of this world of ours, Start to train it to go within. She said, where else will the mind go but to God? The more and more we do this, the more it becomes a habit. My God, my God, my God. She said, when riding as a passenger in a car or at work, wherever there is a moment of an inactivity, for that instant, Let the mind rest in God. My beloved, my love, no matter how busy I am outwardly, my love, I am always thinking of you. What a beautiful way to live our lives more and more in love with God, thinking of the divine with us all the time. You know, we pray before food, we pray before certain things. There was a writer who said this, you say grace before meals 
All right. But I say grace before the concert and the opera and grace before the play and pantomime and grace before I open a book and grace before sketching, painting, swimming, fencing, boxing, walking, playing, dancing and grace before I dip the pen in the ink. Saying grace or having that intimate relationship, that, that conversation inwardly with God. Two of the Master's greatest disciples were Sri Gyanamata and Rajasi Janakananda, both God realized saints. And in Gyanamata's book, God Alone, she, we were sharing some of the letters that she had written to people. She had written many letters of counsel to devotees, but she also wrote a number of letters to the guru. And in one letter, she wrote to the master, and she referred to Roger C. Janakananda as Mr. Lin, because he was known as James Lin before he became Roger C. Janakananda. She wrote to the master, Mr. Lin, whose only wish is to be a channel through which your power may flow to us, sends me his wonderful spiritual vibrations frequently. On the morning I have mentioned, he asked me to come up and meditate with him before he took his sun bath. He always meditates before and after everything, except this one thing, she said. So he's always meditating before and after everything. She goes on in this letter, no words of mine can adequately convey to you Mr. Lin's unselfish devotion. His one thought during these visits is to pour out his wonder power for our sakes. One night he stopped at my door to give me his blessing. He added a word of personal praise which I have now forgotten. And then looking past me, he suddenly said, and there behind you is Swamiji, God bless you, sister. She said the fervor in these words of blessing made them sound more like thanks, as if some credit were due for me for the vision he had of you. And then she closed, Blessed Master, I cannot see you, but I can feel the vibrations of your presence. The joy it gives me each time is so great that I would not exchange it for the wonder of a vision. So we don't need great visions or great experiences. We're just cultivating that intimate relationship to feel the vibrations, the nearness of God and Guru. There was a story of some young music students who were performing at a, for a concert. And their teacher was a, a very adept musician and a wonderful teacher, but she was very demanding. She expected high results from her students. And they started at the age of six and went through the teens. And this one particular concert, all the students came to perform in front of uh, the, uh, their parents. And as each student went up to the piano or whatever instrument they were performing on, um, they were very nervous. But then they became aware of their teacher sitting behind them. And let me read this description. She said, The first child that came out, a nervous six-year-old girl, sits solemnly at the big Steinway. She looks ready to cry until Mrs. Visca, the teacher, emerges from the hall and takes a seat behind the girl. As if remembering something important, the girl sits up straighter, her jitters disappear, her fingers hesitate above the keys, and suddenly there is music. Two perfect measures of Beethoven's Ode to Joy. And so it goes. 23 pupils from the littlest girl to the teenager playing a Mozart sonatina. 
faces tense with fear and concentration light up with joy and pride. All the while, Mrs. Visca sits quietly behind her small musicians. They never turn to look at her, they, yet they perform impeccably because they know she's there, a living example of the best that they can be. This little story illustrates that as we are performing, as we are enacting our roles on this earth stage, that the masters and God are with us all the time. Very demanding because they want us to have that intensity to get away from this Maya delusion. Although very demanding, they know that within us, We have the power, the understanding as the soul. And what comes out most of all is that love and that caring for each one of us, that unconditional love of God and the Guru. We need to perform our duties, play our roles in life, but always remembering that it is God's power flowing through us and that we are doing this for God not for ourselves. Then we can become greater channels for God's love and power to flow to others. The Master said, when you meditate, immerse your whole mind in God. When you are performing a duty, put your whole heart into it. But as soon as you are through with work, place your mind on the Lord. And when you learn to practice the presence of God every moment that you are free to think of him, then even in the midst of work, you will be aware of divine communion. So even in the midst of work, of all of our daily activities and duties, we can have that sense of God's presence. But, We need to focus, we need to concentrate on our work when we're doing it. In the Carmelite monastery, they they jokingly say, Sister, if you can make the soup and at the same time keep in the presence of God, that is wonderful. But if in striving for recollection, you let the soup burn, better for you to keep in the presence of the soup. So we need to concentrate on our duties and then in the gaps of time when we're not working, we can think of God. And then as we become more proficient, we begin to even feel in the midst of our duties that divine presence. Many of you are probably familiar with the little book called The Practice of the Presence of God. And these are letters that were written by that 17th century saint, Brother Lawrence. And our guru mentions him in his autobiography. He said, Brother Lawrence, the 17th century Christian mystic, tells us his first glimpse of God realization came about by viewing a tree. Nearly all human beings have seen a tree. Few, alas, have thereby seen the tree's creator. Most men are utterly incapable of summoning those irresistible powers of devotion that are effortlessly possessed only by a few ecantins, single-hearted saints found in all religious paths, whether of east or west. Yet, Master said, the ordinary man is not therefore shut out from the possibility of divine communion. He needs for soul recollection no more than the Kriya Yoga technique, a daily observance of the moral precepts and an ability to cry sincerely, Lord, I yearn to know Thee. So even though Brother Lawrence had that experience, Guruji said, most of us don't have that capability, but as we practice Kriya and the other techniques of meditation, more and more, we will have that devotion. And we will be able to cry out sincerely, Lord, be with me, help me. 
And keep it simple. All of the great saints that you read about, they have kept their relationship with God very simple. We remember in the autobiography of a yogi when Guruji was at the Kali God temple and he was looking at that, that statue of Mother Kali. That, that was opposite forces of good and evil. And that sage came and he said, God is simple. Everything else is complex. So we need to keep our relationship with God very simple. And Gyanamata, that saint who had that motto of God alone, she wrote about Brother Lawrence. She said, the thing about the life of Brother Lawrence that has stood out in my memory ever since I read the book, The Practice of the Presence of God, is the simplicity of his relationship with God. When he failed, when he did wrong, he said, that is the way I am. That is the way I shall always be unless you help me, meaning unless you, my Lord, help me. Gyanamata said, this simple prayer, this simple attitude of the mind shows the truest humility. It says, I know well that I am nothing, but let your power flow into me and I shall be saved. I shall be all that you want me to be, all that I long to be. Tears and groans of shame and agony will not do for the soul what the above simple prayer will do. That simple, humble prayer, knowing that without you, my God, I can't do anything. But if I allow you to flow through me, then I can do anything. When that infinite, unlimited power comes through us, and the peace and the love and the joy through God contact, then we're beginning to, in a greater way, manifest our true nature. A few closing remarks before we have a time for praying for the well-being of those in the world, sending out healing vibrations. Let me close with these words of our Guru. He said, Joy lies in continually thinking of God. The longing for Him should be constant. A time comes when your mind never wanders away, when not even the greatest affliction of body, mind, and soul can take your consciousness from the living presence of God. Is that not wonderful? To live and think and feel God all the time? To remain in the castle of his presence whence death nor not, nor not else can take you away? And then Guruji quotes Krishna from the Bhagavad Gita. On me fix thy mind, be thou my devotee. With ceaseless worship bow reverently before me. Having thus united thyself to me as thy highest goal, thou shalt be mine own. And then Guruji ends by saying, when you are proof against all desires, you are enjoying the presence eternal. To enjoy that presence eternal with us every moment of our existence. Now let us sit for a few moments and pray for those who have asked for healing prayers for body, mind, soul, and also to pray for greater peace and brotherhood and understanding in the world. And then after we sit for a few moments, then we'll practice our master's healing exercise.
Now, if you will all stand and we'll practice Master's healing exercise together. Please pray after me. Divine Mother, Thou art omnipresent. Thou art in all Thy children. Manifest Thy healing presence in their bodies. Om. Divine Mother, Thou art omnipresent. Thou art in all Thy children. Manifest Thy healing presence in their minds. Om. Divine Mother, Thou art omnipresent. Thou art in all Thy children. Manifest Thy healing presence in their souls. Om. Let us raise our arms and chant Om for greater peace and understanding and harmony throughout the world. Om. Let us have our closing prayer. Heavenly Father, Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Bhagavan Krishna, Mahavatar Babaji, Lahiri Mahashai, Swami Sri Yukteswarji, and our Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, saints of all religions, I bow to you all. Divine Mother, bless me that I may find thee in the temple of each thought, each activity. Finding thee within, I shall find thee without, in all people and in all conditions. Om, peace, amen. <laughs>